In the western regions of Indonesia, vast expanses of greenery grace the landscape. Many people have moved here from the city to work on the tea and rubber plantations. They came seeking a better life, but they faced new challenges with their living conditions. Global mission pioneers, Iwan and Jamal, saw the pressing needs of this community and took steps to address them. This is our way of demonstrating care for the locals here. We observed the absence of electricity and basic sanitation facilities. Taking action, we advocated for electricity installation through discussions with government representatives. Praise God, they now have access to power. Moreover, we constructed toilets addressing the previous lack of such facilities. Through meeting these needs, the pioneers have built strong friendships with people in the community. Despite their differing beliefs, the locals have warmly embraced the pioneers. When they come here, they come for fellowship, just to see us and pray for us. After solving the electricity and sanitation issues, the pioneers focused on providing education for the community children, most of whom didn't attend school. My desire for our fellow community members here is for them to undergo transformations, lifting them from constant struggles so that they may enhance their understanding, particularly in education and spirituality. It's my hope that at least one or two individuals will emerge as steadfast servants of God from this place. The pioneers' affection, compassion, and dedication to serving this community have made a positive impact on its children and their parents. I love when Mr. Jamal and Mr. Awan come to our place. My children eagerly anticipate the moments when they can meet Mr. Jamal and Mr. Awan. Their genuine compassion and warm-hearted nature resonate deeply with my kids. Kindly pray for us to maintain our passion in serving and for the well-being of the souls we aid. Pray for their challenges, health, education, and financial struggles as we seek ways to address these needs while staying focused on anticipating God's return, a challenge we aim to navigate with grace. Just as Jesus sacrificed himself, we should emulate his service as an example for us. We aim for Jesus' mission to resonate within the hearts of every individual we serve in this place. Thank you for supporting global mission pioneers, such as Iwan and Jamal, who serve Jesus sacrificially in their corners of the world. There we go. All right, Jumbo. There we go. Now you're with me. Okay, so I have just a very brief, I don't want to call it a sermon, maybe just sharing some thoughts and more of a word of encouragement for us all. But before I do, um, I have a question to ask you. I'm glad to have a few teachers in the congregation here. It's always good to have teachers because I'm sure they'll answer the question. What is the best letter you've ever received in your life? What's the best letter you ever received in your life? If you can think of one letter that, this is a really good letter that I, I, I loved. Huh? A lesson? A, lesson? Letter. a letter, a letter. Yes, letter, letter. Just a letter, yes. In the mail or whatever. I'm assuming I'm in good company here of people who used to write and receive letters, not text messages, right? I'm not talking about text messages here, letters. Miss, Miss Gail, what was the best letter you ever received? From my students. From your students? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Victor? Oh, yeah. From my grandmother. 
From your grandmother? Yeah. Um, okay. My grandmother, um, she was on an island. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I was on uh, another island called St. Thomas in the US right now. Mm-hmm. And we would ride back and forth. Yeah. And then um, she got some Parkinson's with the tremble in the mm-hmm. back. Um, so she told me sometimes she has to write two letters to get one. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. This is a year from. Immigration. <laughs> Which, what did you say? Visa denied? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. What about uh, anybody got um, one you'd say the worst letter you ever received? Huh? The worst, John. The one that starts out with, uh, "We received dozens of applications." And then they go on to tell you yeah. um, that you weren't selected. You are not selected. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the bills, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Do first letter. Jury duty. <laughs> you don't like those. Okay. All right. Anybody ever got a very useless letter? Oh, Tony, you had your hand up. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Excellent. No, thanks for sharing. Anybody got a useless letter? Like which one? Every week? <laughs> Jack Mail. Jack Yeah. Well, no, thank, thank you for sharing. Um, Today, I just want to talk a little bit about a letter that's in the Bible. But before I go there, thank you for sharing your thoughts about the letters. When you talk about the best letters that you ever received, there's something about a relationship that you have with the person who sent the letter. When Ms. Gail and, and, and Victor and Tuana talk about their, the letters they received, there's something special about receiving a letter from somebody who you know cares about you and cares for you. Um, and like you, one of my best letters I ever received, well, most of my best letters or from my grandma. I, I went to a, a boarding school and every, um, every so often my grandma would send me a letter um, and I looked forward to those letters. They had a pattern, you know, um, the first paragraph would be, how are you doing? Um, it's something around, the Lord has been good to me, keeping us all safe. And then the second paragraph usually a summary of the things that have happened since her last letter. The animals gave birth, the chickens are good, your grandfather is okay, be tired, blah, blah, blah. Just an update of what's happening. Then the third paragraph would be something around me. How are you doing? With some instructions, you know. I'm praying for you. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Whatever the instructions were. And then there's always an encouragement that went with it. Okay? And at the end of reading that letter, you feel, I want to respond. I sit down again and start writing. And, and respond to my grandma. 
So there is something special about having a letter from somebody who you care about or somebody who cares about you. Um, in school, when we were students, we were taught how to write letters. I don't know if they still do that right these days, but we were taught that a good letter was always clear. Make sure that um, your purpose and intent is very clear. A good letter was always correct. Make sure that it's also complete. Have you ever got a letter that's incomplete? The sentence leaves you wondering what they were trying to say. And a good letter was always courteous. Okay? Um, it was always trying to make sure that the, the person reading it uh, understands and knows that um, you, you're thinking about them. And back then, when I tell my son about how we wrote letters, he asks me, where did you get all that time from? Because we used to sit down and just write three, four pages. No delete button, no erasing. You just kind of think through it and just be very intentional in what you're writing. I hope you all still write letters, by the way. I hope that you still find time to write letters. Paul, in today's um, verse that I want to share here, it's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3. Paul says here, you are, in some versions, it says you are a letter. In other versions, it says you are, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are a letter of Christ, ministers by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. That's what Paul was writing to the Corinthians in chapter 2, uh, in chapter th Second Corinthians chapter 3. Paul was telling his readers, you are a letter. Your lives are a letter. Okay? Not written with this human ink, but by the spirit of the God, of the Lord. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. One of the best letters we have is the Bible. The Bible has lots of good letters in there. There are some letters of instruction. Um, Exodus chapter 20, for example, you have letters of instruction. You have letters of action in Nehemiah. A good letter is one that makes you want to act. You know, Nehemiah in chapter 2 was asked, asked the, the king asked him, why are you so sad and why do you look so unhappy? And he says, give me some letters so I can go and get some materials to rebuild the temple of the Lord. There are some letters of encouragement. But then there are also some letters of rebuke. Galatians chapter 3, I think, was where Paul starts his letter by saying, oh, foolish Galatians. Can you imagine receiving a letter and instead of saying, dear Victor, it says, oh, foolish Victor. <laughs> How would you feel about that? Okay. It never happened. It will not happen, Victor. Don't even worry about that. Okay. There are some letters of rebuke. But there are also some letters of fear. If you remember the story of, um, in the book of Esther, where Haman convinced the king, let's write some letters and spread it to all these people and tell them, they're done. We're going to kill them all. There's some letters of fear. But then there are also letters of courage. In the book of Joshua, for example, where God says, Joshua, be of good courage. Okay? Then there are letters of judgment and of eternal life. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those. But let me go back to Paul's letter and, and, and his, his verses that we have up here. There is something that Paul cherished about this church in Corinth. As a bit of a background, Corinth was a very, um, a very rich city. We are told that at one point the city was destroyed, but then about a century later it was rebuilt. It lay on a strip of land in the Corinth Gulf, but had a lot of uh, commercial areas, the big vessels and the ships and all that. So Corinth was a very, very strategic place. Now, we're also told in all that, um, Corinth was also a very corrupt place. If you're looking for idols, there were, there were idols in, in Corinth. If, if you're looking for um, 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 dissension, everything that you could look for in Corinth was there. And as Paul ministered to the Corinthians, he got to the place where he says, you know, you, you need to know the Lord. Uh, we're, we're told here by the historians that um, most of the people who, be, who converted to Christianity 
uh, from Corinth were still influenced by the things that were running around the city. One author actually says that a church is inevitably re reflective of the society in which it exists. The church is reflective of the society in which it exists. So what happened back then is the corruption that was around Corinth came into the church. The idolatry that was out in, the, in, the, in, in Corinth came into the church. So much so that um, Paul had to say something about it. We're also told that in, in Corinth, um, because of the mix of people, there was conflict. Okay? There were Romans, there were Greeks, there were all kinds of people because it was a very commercial place. So there's always conflict and tensions because of people's backgrounds, where they came from and what, what they're doing. All that conflict, guess what? Came to the church. There was conflict in the church because of that. But Paul was convinced that there's reason why God wanted the church in Corinth to exist. We're told that we, he met uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and together they decided to evangelize in, in, in Corinth. And the Bible says, as we will read in a few minutes here, that um, he never gave up on Corinth. Just because the influences of the world came into the church, Paul never gave up on the church. And he chose to write this letter on 1 Corinthians to the church to encourage them. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles. I'm going to encourage you to open your, whether it's on the phone, we're going to walk through a few verses, and they're not going to be on the screen, on some of the things that Paul said. Again, think back about a good letter. A good letter is one where somebody has written with you in mind, has written for a good purpose, a good reason to encourage you, a good reason to also to try and uh, touch your heart. And so Paul, beginning in chapter 1, he says here that, um, you know, first of all, he identifies himself, I'm apostle of the Lord. And he, in verse 3, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then I love verse 4. If you read verse 4, Paul says, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you've been enriched in every way. The church in Corinth was enriched in every way that you could think of. And he says here, in all your speaking, in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gifts. This is a church that a group of people who never lacked any spiritual gifts. They had everything. And Paul was excited about them saying, I'm really happy that you're such a blessed group and you're such a blessed people. And it says here in verse, verse 7, Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you'll be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ. Our Lord he is faithful. That's an opening statement. That's what God is telling us today, too. We are all here as we sit together. We are enriched with gifts. God has gifted us everything we need that will keep us to the day of our, the Lord Jesus comes. However, he goes on in the next uh, few verses here. He says, I appeal to you in verse 10, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you do what? You agree with one another. Remember I mentioned that this is a church that there was a lot of division outside the church. It came into the church. And Paul is saying, do not let that division do what separate you. I want you and I encourage you that we all agree with one another so that there's no what? There's no division among you, that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. Okay? Now go back to the verse that we had talked earlier. You are a letter. You are the letter of Christ. It's saying, do not be divided, but instead be united so that people will see in you and through you the goodness and the love of God. Paul goes on in chapter 2. We're going to walk through all the 16 chapters, so stick with me here. In chapter 2, he tells them also in verse, um, I think it's verse 10, about God revealing his spirit to, to us. He says, um, the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit of um, the spirit who is from God. So Paul is telling them here, you have the spirit of God. Earlier on during our Sabbath school, somebody asked, do you, would you like to know when you, you're going to die? 
I said yes, most people said no. Paul is saying here, the spirit knows everything here. Don't worry about that. In chapter three, stick with me in chapter three, God is saying here that, um, Paul is telling the, um, the, the, the Corinthians in verse 16 of chapter three, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Amen. Don't you know that you're God's what? God's temple, okay? Yes, you may have come from outside of the, in the world, but now that you're in Christ, you are a temple. He's telling them, God has made you a temple. That's a special thing. That means that God dwells in you. God dwells with you. And he says in, in that verse, um, verse 16, don't you know that you yourself are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? If anybody destroys God's temple, God will destroy the temple. And then he goes on to warn them, just because you're God's temple, on verse 18, he says, do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become what? He may become wise. So what, what, what he is saying here is, yes, you are the temple of the Lord, but don't be arrogant about it. Don't be deceived about it. Stay in, in, in Christ. And then Paul goes on, and in, verse, um, in chapter 5, again, remember we talked about there was immorality out in the world that came into the church? Paul here is warning and saying, um, um, you know, if I think we go down to verse, um, verse, verse 9, of all that was happening, in fact, the, the chapter begins that there was such immorality that there were even church members who were sleeping with their, um, their, their, husband, their fathers, wives, and all that. It was that bad. But in verse 9, Paul says, you know what, I've written to you in my letters, do not associate with people who are immoral. Because why? You are the temple of God. Okay? You are the temple of God. You've been given all these gifts. Do not associate with any of these immoral or immoralities or even idolaters. Because he says in verse 10, not, all, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers. I don't want to associate. Leave those things outside that, 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 that were out there because you've been called to a holy living. In chapter 6, Paul actually also goes on to say, you don't need to drag each other to court all the time, okay? Because we're always dragging each other to court, you know? Sounds familiar? We live in a country where it's not, it's not, you know, yeah, we like the court system, right? Okay, it works. And Paul is saying, settle, settle all these things because it, 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 it says here on verse two, do you not know that the saints will do what? Will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? We will be called to be judges of even the angels. And Paul is saying, if you're going to be judges up there, why can't you just settle these things among you? Why don't you do all that? All those things happen in the world and you're coming to the church. Let those be bygones because you are a letter. You are the letter that reflects Christ. And so God, uh, Paul is telling them, leave all those losses behind. Verse 12 of chapter 6, Paul again says, somebody says, everything is permissible to me but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. That's a strong statement. There's a lot of things that we want to do that may look good or may sound good, but he says not everything here is what is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but in verse 12 he says, I will not be mastered by anything. I will not make anything be a master over me that takes me away from Christ. And Paul is saying to the, to the Corinthians, do your best not to be yoked with these things that are not beneficial to you. And then he spends the whole of chapter 7 talking about marriage and how we all conduct ourselves. And he basically says, you know, back in the world, we are told historically that Corinth was one of the most corrupt places. In fact, when he went to the temple, there were even prostitutes in the temple as part of the worship. And Paul is saying, do not be involved in all that. I don't want you to be part of that. You've been called to be better, better than that. And chapter 8, and I'm getting somewhere on this here, Paul talks about idols. In, in, in the outside world, in Corinth, there were so many idols, so, so many idols, that they were sacrificing up even the children. And Paul is saying, you don't, you don't need to be part of that whole stuff. You need to trust in the Lord. Do we have idols today? 
Yes, we do. Okay. Are there many of them? Yes, they are. Are they silent and loud ones? Yes, they are. But Paul is saying, you know what? Live that life. You don't need idols. Okay? You don't need to pray to something or someone that, that, that cannot even respond to you. Stick with the Lord. Pray to the Lord. Trust the Lord. And let him be the one who is um, fighting for you. And then let me jump on to a little bit on chapter 10. Paul goes back to history, and sometimes we are told that we need to remember our past to appreciate our present and to have hope for the future. And here's what Paul says in chapter 10, verse 1. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, my brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the spiritual food and they drank the spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that was accompanied that accompanied them, and that rock was who? That rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered all over the desert. In other words, Paul is telling them, just because you've been called and chosen, just because God has worked with you, should you neglect him, that fate that fell on the people back in the day would also fall upon you. That very same fate, just because they walked with the Lord, but they did not obey him, what happened? They were all... Um, they're all destroyed. And the chapter goes on to talk about these things. And in verse 11 of chapter 10, Paul says, these things happened to them as examples and were written as warnings for us. Okay. All these things happened to them, but they were written as warnings for us. And it says, verse 12, so if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when we are tempted, he also provides a way out so that you can stand under it. That's a promise. Amen. That's a promise he's making. That yes, all these things may happen, you get all these temptations, but I am faithful. I am a faithful God that you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. And our sister sang that song encouraging us However bad it may look, however difficult it may seem, the promise is, I will be there with you. I will not give you more than you can bear. But when you're tempted, I will provide a way out. So even if it seemed hopeless, if it seems useless, it seemed like nothing else could do, God is telling us to trust him. He's calling us to trust him. And that's not always easy. It takes faith to trust God in those situations. But that's what he's calling us to do. In, 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 in chapter 11, he talks about worship. Again, remember he's telling the Corinthians, you came out from all this craziness out there. As you're coming into the church now, we want to make sure that you understand how to, 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 to be reverent before the Lord. And even gives instructions on how to go with the Lord's Supper on that chapter that we usually use during our communion service. But Paul instructs them on, on what to do. And then as he gets towards the end of this book, in chapter 12, now Paul tells them, I want you to know that you have been blessed with spiritual gifts. I don't want you to be ignorant. Okay? When you are pagans, when you do not know any better, you are influenced and led astray by idols. And verse 3 of chapter 12 says, Therefore I tell you, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cast. Or no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. And then God, Paul goes ahead and tells them and tells us this morning, there are different kinds of gifts by the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service by the same Lord, the same Lord. There are different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men. And he tells them how we all have gifts that we've been given to use for the glory of God's name. And that's what he's telling us here, that all of us have different, if you go verse 12 onwards, we may have many parts, but we are one body in Christ. Amen. That's what he's telling us here. We are one body in Christ. Think again as uh, the verse we read earlier, that you are the letter. When people see us, they will be seeing this letter of unity. They'll be seeing Christ. We may all be different in our own ways, but one thing that will be very certain and very clear in those seeing us is they're going to see Christ in us. Amen. That's what Paul is saying. You may be many parts, but it's one body. And he goes on to even describe and says, the hand cannot say to the leg, I don't need you. The eye cannot tell the ear, I don't need you. That tells how important we all are to each other. 
we cannot say we don't need each other. We all need each other. We all support each other. And then Sister Gail says, are you praying for a school? Are we praying for the school? We are all part of this together as a family of God. We pray for one another. The Corinthians thought they knew what love was all about. And Paul spends chapter 13 explaining what love is and what love is not. He tells them it's not enough to give your money. Because they thought, mm, as long as I give money to Joy, that's love. Joy, you should be grateful that I gave you money. Um, it says, it's not enough to say that I have faith that can move a mountain. That is not enough to show love. But rather, he says, love is what? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It is not rude. Is it? It's not rude. I happen to travel every so often, and sometimes it's amazing things you see at the airport. It's, it's not easy to get people angry and show some kind of rudeness that you wonder what happened to that person because people are angry. But it says love is not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, okay? Love is not about showing our temper and our anger. It's not easily angered. But it says love rejoices in truth. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres. That's what Paul is telling the Corinthians here. Love perseveres. He says it never fails. Love never fails. Again, the Corinthians thought they knew what love was all about. But Paul is telling them this is what love is about. And he goes on in chapter 14 to tell them about the, the gifts, okay, on the prophecies and the promises. You have all these gifts, but use them wisely. Use them wisely. That's what he's trying to summarize in chapter 14. You all have these gifts, but use them, use them wisely. Um, as, as, as he moved on to chapter 15, which is one of my favorite chapters, there's a lot of confusion in the church about the resurrection. Paul uses this time and tells them, you know what, don't be ignorant about the resurrection. And goes on to tell them that, yes, all of us may die, but beyond that, there's life in Christ, eternal life in Christ, Amen. that we should all look forward to. Don't let anybody tell you, oh, we need, you need, you, you, you're going to be here, or you're going to be there. He spends this whole chapter and tells them that there is a resurrection. And in verse 20 of chapter 15, he says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since then, since death came through one man, one man, resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. For in Ed Adam, we all died. In Christ, we all will be made alive. All of us. So if Christ died and resurrected, Paul is assuring the Corinthians and assuring us also, we as a letter should be preaching about the resurrection and eternal life. That is the letter that should be coming from us. And so he talks about what, what the resurrection is like. And then in chapter 16, he just ends with a thanksgiving and saying as a personal request, you know what? Thank you for all that you're doing. Be on your guard, stand firm. On verse 13 of, of chapter 16, be on your guard, stand firm in faith and be men of courage, be strong and do everything in love. That's what Paul tells this group. The church was in turmoil and Paul took time in that love for the church for the love of a grandmother, the love of a student, to say, I care about you, I care for you. Here are things for you to, 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 to remember. So when, by the time he comes to this chapter, um, chapter three, he basically says, with all these things that have happened, I want you to remember one thing. You are a letter. You are a letter. Not written by ink, but inscribed in our heart. That when people see you, they give glory and thanks to God. When people see you, they give thanks to the Lord. So if we are then a letter, here are seven things I'd like to leave with you this, this afternoon about, um, about this. What type of letter ought we to be? Number one, you remember that when the, some of the uh, people came to Philip and what did they say? We want to see Jesus. Be a letter that leads others to Christ. Okay? Be a letter that leads others to Christ. Christ called Peter and said, follow me. What did they do? They followed him. Be a letter that leads others to Christ. Number two, be a letter that directs others to scripture. 
so that people know the truth, not our own theories, our own cultures, or our own beliefs, or our own education. Be a letter here that directs others to scripture. Be a letter that speaks truth, number three, that speaks truth at all times because God is truth and God is love. Actually, speaks truth in love and with love. Be a letter that nourishes and heals and brings witness because that's what God is calling us to. Don't be one that causes stress. There are some letters I receive, especially some emails on a Monday morning, and I choose not to open them in the morning. I kind of hold off maybe a bit later in the day. But there are some letters that are very stressful, and you can tell just by sometimes who's sending the letter, this is going to be a stressful day. You know? okay. And they start, I greet you in Jesus' name. And then it has all this stuff. You're like, oh, Lord, this is a tough letter. And then it signs off, you as in Christ. But there are tough letters in there. Be one that doesn't uh, cause bitterness. Be a letter that is consistent in word and in deed. And I love what Paul says to the Philippians. Be a letter that is joyful and thankful and prayerful and peaceful. That's what he says um, that Paul was telling the, um, the Philippians at the time. But yes, we are a letter. We don't need any letter of recommendations, as Paul is saying. But rather, our lives are a letter written in, in our hearts. You're a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. A letter not written in ink or with pen, but with the spirit of the living God. One of the best letters, again, like I said, is in the Bible. And I like how Revelation 22 ends. As, 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 as I wrap up here. And sorry to the people at the back, I didn't, I didn't keep my notes according to the slides, but we are good. It says here, let me just read here, turn with me to Revelation 22, verse 12. If you have your Bibles, just turn with me to Revelation 22, um, verse 12 onwards. Revelation 22, verse 12, and I'm going to read all the way to the end of that, that chapter. Here's, here's what Christ says, and behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they, have, they may have the right of, to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirst come, whosoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things that are written in this book. He who testifies to these things say, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That is the letter that God is sending to us. That is the letter he's calling us also to be to all those who see us. You are the letter. You are God's letter. Let your life be God's letter. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the Bible that you've given us to help us reveal who you are and for your spirit that you've given us to live in us. Lord, our desire is to follow you, to be witnesses for you. As you've given us your letter, help us, Lord, to be letters also of encouragement and cheer to others. And Lord, that's our desire as we wait for you and for your second coming. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this fellowship. May you be with us through the rest of the day because we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.